Listen now to Scripture as I read it to you from the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. This is from the 10th chapter. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall love me, the Lord your God, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, and when he came to the place and saw him, he too passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, and having poured oil and wine on them, and then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I was feeling pretty good this week about the sermon for Sunday. I thought I had a clever sermon put together. Love the title, Roadkill. But sometime between Thursday evening and this morning, it became apparent to me that clever was not good. And so Saturday morning, yesterday, I sat down and started from scratch again. Why? Because the events of this past week the deaths of two black men and then the murder of five policemen in Dallas, Texas, have overwhelmed our news and our collective consciousness as well they should. Consequently, the content of my sermon is different than plain. And yet, with some irony, it's still the same message. It's just a little more immediate and more urgent. And so let us consider the parable of the Good Samaritan. The occasion for Jesus' parable was the question put to him by a lawyer. What must I do to have eternal life? Now certainly all of us think about that and we struggle with that question. You know, the promise of eternal life is something that we cling to. It is something for which we hope. Eternal life is about the future. It's about hope. It's about promise. Alas, the common thread all of us share is our own mortality and the fear regarding the unknown future. What must I do to inherit eternal life? The lawyer who asked this question of Jesus was obviously a good lawyer because he knew what the answer was before he asked it. Love God with all your being and your neighbor as yourself. But the lawyer asked a follow-up question. Who exactly is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And Jesus responded with a well-known story, the parable of the Good Samaritan. The neighbor we are called to love is the one we deeply distrust and despise. 
who say Samaritans were hated and vilified by the Hebrew people. Now first, they were believed to be racially impure. During the Babylonian captivity, they supposedly intermarried with their captors and were regarded as unclean. Now second, they were heretics. Now they didn't have their theology right. You know, instead of worshiping at the temple like a good Jewish person would, they worshiped at a mountain. And the Hebrew people believed that they had, these Samaritans had perverted the teachings of Jesus. How dare they? How dare they? And then they were regarded, as I said, as being unclean. If a Samaritan were as much as to touch a Hebrew person, that person would have to go through a ritual cleansing process to become acceptable to the community of dead. Samaritans were despised. The division between the Hebrew people and the Samaritan people was bitter, ugly, and it had existed for generations. They were divided racially, ideologically, and socially. They had nothing but contempt for each other. And there was no interaction between the two groups. Jesus' parable about neighbor love as the key to eternal life was surely shocking to the ears of his Jewish audience. A Samaritan helping a Jew? The Christ parable, when we look at it, is about crossing social political, ideological, racial, religious, and economic divisions to assist, to help, and to be helped. Now, I understand there's still a small Samaritan community, 800 to 1,000 people in the Middle East. But that is not where the divisions are in our society anymore, no. This week, brought out to start relief, we are still in the divided world, and that we are willing to shed blood, destroy lives, kill and maim to pay homage to the principalities and powers that divide us. We're divided by religions Jew, Muslim, Christian, Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist. And these differences have manifest themselves throughout the globe in bloodshed and in death and destruction, even in this 21st century. We're divided politically. We are in the midst of what promises to be an extremely ugly political season. The political process, which at one time was, as I learned it in civics class in the eighth grade, was the art of the possible, the ability to negotiate, the ability to compromise between polarities, has somehow become a zero-sum activity. I'm right and you're wrong, period. And this binary approach, this either-or approach, has divided communities. It's divided families, my own included. And it's divided our nation itself. And we think that this is without its consequences? By the racial, the tragic events of this past week witnessed to our racial divisions and cast a pall-like shadow over our history, and they still haunt our common life. We're divided economically. There is a huge segment within our society that feels as though they've been left out, forgotten, overlooked by the powers that be. Many of them are scraping by, looking for some type of hope, some type of leader who will deliver them, and they're white and they're black, and they're brown, and they speak different languages, and they speak English. But they have one thing in common. They feel neglected, wounded. They feel as though they are left by the side of the road. And somehow, lately, we have played them against each other. So they regard each other as the other. Now, the issues today are not about Jews and Samaritans but rather the visceral contempt which characterized their antipathy for each other is still manifest in our world today. So we come to church on Sunday. And I stand in the pulpit on Sunday. 
And I struggle with the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Because that's what it's all about, isn't it? And Jesus responds to that question and says, reach across these divisions. Take the risk of alienation that accompanies being a neighbor to those who are different, to those who think differently, to those who believe differently, to those who pray differently, to those who look a little bit different than you do. Reach across those boundaries in the same way this good Samaritan did. Consider the risk that that Samaritan took. He took the risk of rejection. Can you imagine were he to come up to that man lying there dying by the road? And the person looks up at him and sees the Samaritan because you recognize him by his garb and says, I would rather die than let you help me. Reaching out to help takes the risk of rejection. It's also the risk of blind prejudice. You know, the innkeeper could have seen him approaching, recognize him again through his Samaritan heart and say, don't even come in here. I don't want your money. We don't allow your kind. And then, of course, there is the risk of personal safety. The Samaritan, by merely stopping, he could have been himself. Jesus speaks to us. And he tells us, take these risks and inherit eternal life. I think there's an easy way to choose that route. Many do. It's a way of blame. It's the president's fault. It's the Republican's fault. It's the Democrat's fault. It's the media's fault. Pick your group and you can blame them. It's an easy way to go. No risk. You don't have to take responsibility. You can even feel a little bit self-righteous because it's not you. You get the point to someone else. And often our default reaction to these tragic events is to go into that blame game. We should get stuck there. Because it only leads to more vindictiveness, more division, more bloodshed, and yes, more death. And here's the thing. If I read Jesus right, it's not the way to eternal life. There's another easy way, and that's denial. It won't happen here. There's not really a problem. Or a new one. It's only being created and fueled by the media. But we cannot deny the bodies of the innocent lying dead in our streets. They're visible evidence of cultural, social, and economic divisions in our society. Ironically, these two approaches were embodied by the priest and the Levite when they saw a man dying by the side of the road. And I can almost hear them saying to themselves as they walk by, he shouldn't have been out here during the evening time, or you know, he only got what was coming for him, he should have taken more precautions, or you know, probably the better one, I'm just too busy, I know someone else will stop. Perhaps, you know, I look out for myself. I don't want to get hurt. If I stop, I might get loved too. Blame and denial. They're easy and they're convenient. And like I say, sometimes there are a default reaction, but they are not Christ's way to eternal life. Jesus taught that eternal life is about being a good neighbor. It's about reaching across the boundaries that divide us. It's about taking the risks to stop, measure the situation, and respond with love. I believe that we can respond faithfully to the events of this past week as Christians, not by blaming nor by denial, but by reaching across the divisions that exist. We need to find ways to speak with one another about our political, economic, racial, and social divides without blaming, without accusing, and without vilifying. And we probably need to start within our own families. I know I need to in mind. And let me get to this. Language does matter. We need to find language in the right tone, even, so that the words that we use will not further alienate and engender more content and hatred. And second, we need to affirm, as Jesus did, 
in this parable that there is more than unites us as neighbors that divides us. We are all children of God. We need to find concrete ways to express this in our common life. It means that we have a greater mission beyond coming together here, preaching and singing about our salvation. We need to live it in the world. And we live it by expressing love for our neighbor. But we risk losing it. I'm going to include with a hopeful note. And the message, I think, of Jesus is not some body job behind the sky dream. I have seen it become real in the lives of people like you and like me. I have seen divisions, intractable divisions, overcome by people of faith who are willing to take risks. I'm going to share one with you. I may have shared it with you before. Now they're a small group or even from the pulpit. But let me share this one with you. Two people, Anne and Lynn. They were both members of my church in New York. One was the president statewide organization called Life Right. It was a group that came together to oppose the practice of abortion. They were involved in civil disobedience, which included chaining themselves to clinics and physicians' offices. The other was the president of the chapter of Planned Parenthood. She was equally involved in women's health issues, including the availability of abortion. Both were members of my congregation. And would you know, both of them would show up every Sunday morning. What a blessing that was. And you'd think, well, one would sit here, one would sit there. One would think that this was a pastor's nightmare. But I will say, as surely as I stand here before you, that they were both a blessing to me. And they were a blessing to that church and to that community. Here's the thing. They taught Sunday school together each week. That's why they will show up on Sunday. They were my daughter's Sunday school teachers. Team taught. And I'm convinced that part of her Christian education was formed by their instruction, but also by the faith that they exhibited in their differences and in reaching across those differences. They prayed together. They sang hymns together. You know, it wasn't just a one-time thing. About five, eight years later, when I moved to Texas, they drove down together in a van. That's a two-and-a-half-day drive. To attend a Sunday school teacher's event, they drove down together at dinner with us. And I just kind of shook my head. Awesome. And after dinner, when they had left, I asked the parent, I asked the parent, I said, Karen, now tell me the truth. Who do you think is right, Lynn or Anne? Karen responded, they both are. They both are. They were both right, by right? risking reputation and scorn to reach across what many regard as an intractable boundary marked by contempt and scorn. They were both right by bringing civility to an extremely divisive issue in our society. They were both right in their acknowledgement that there exists a common ground for all humanity. And I will tell you where that common ground is. It is the ground before the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There we stand together. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus illustrates two approaches to the hate-filled divisions that vex our world. We can ignore, we can blame, we can walk on by. Or we can take the risk of caring, cross the boundaries of indifference, cross those barriers of contempt, and practice neighbor love. Only one way leads.